on this computer. Okay. Welcome everyone to the March FM Disc meeting. I'm bright and perky this morning. Uh, I'm Lynn Allen, one of the board members, and I am the organizer of this meeting. Uh, one thing we're going to ask is that during the presentations, you mute yourselves so that we don't get background noise. If you need to quickly unmute, just hit your space bar so you can ask a question or make a comment. Um, and after our second presentation, we'll be um, breaking out into breakout rooms where you get to schmooze with everyone. It'll be fun. After that, there'll be news and announcements. Um, and if you need to message me privately to get in on the announcements, that's fine. I will be take, uh, reading questions from the chat into the discussion. Um, so to feel free to send them into chat or to make them yourselves. Um, today we're hearing from Nico Tartaris. I hope I said that correctly. And Russ Cohn. Uh, Nico's got a nice um, case study. And then we'll be talking about um, AI and its various intersections with FileMaker and usefulness in our lives. Uh, Dave Knight has a little tiny tidbit and Chris Moyer's got his news roundup, which we're looking forward to. So we're going to have Nico. Nico, are you ready? Yes, I am. Take it away. Share your screen and it says um, disabled host disabled. Okay, Excuse hold on. <clears throat> I am not the co-host. Okay, there we go. You should be able to share now. There we go. Well, good morning, uh, everybody. My name is Nico Trotaris. There's no E in it, but. That's okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. It's a, it's a simple Greek name, uh, but I think it throws people off because it's um, symmetric. There's a T in the middle and an A's on the side. Anyway, I've been uh, w working with FileMaker since 88. Um, I've created a lot of solutions and the case study I want to show you is a medical client that I uh, started work we, working with five years ago. Um, I was asked to develop an EMR system. I didn't even know what the acronym meant. Um, and so the discussion will be um, this case study, how we switched to telehealth in a week, I think because it was FileMaker. I think it would take a lot longer to switch um, if we'd use another language. Then I'm going to show some applications, two simple applications in the health industry concerning AI. Um, and then later on in the day, we're having another discussion more fully into AI. <clears throat> I am because of HIPAA compliance and uh, proprietary information, I've recorded <clears throat> the demo and we'll just be showing the telehealth component. Uh, as you can see, the solution has many things. It takes care of payroll, you know, uh, everything to do with running the business. And I think, um, so telehealth was something that fell upon us in uh, March of 2020. Um, I had kind of warned everybody in January that we should have some plan in place for COVID and nobody responded. So I decided to keep my mouth shut so I don't look like a, a nut job, you know, <laughs> so, so then all of a sudden, so the um, patients we have are workman's comp and they uh, enter into a program. I will run this recording and then pause to explain how I created the logistics and how it works. And we'll end up with how the patient has a quick and easy interface to join the Zoom uh, meetings. So let's um, start. Welcome to this tutorial on how we switched to telehealth in less than a week at uh, a medical company where I had a contract to develop an EMR system. <coughs> it all uh, revolves around programs. So um, I developed a... So can everybody hear clearly and see the screen? Yeah. 
it, it's coming through fine. Okay. So here's a list of some of the patients, um, <clears throat> all does, you know, Jane Doe. And basically, um, if they join the program, this is the main console to manage the, uh, the, pro the patients in the program. It's a schedule. So every day we put in the schedule what um, sessions would be going on, uh, what type of sessions. And what the system does is every uh, morning it goes and creates the next day sessions. And the reason we did that is because things change so rapidly during the week that we can only do one schedule, one day schedule at a time. So here's a, a master schedule, and I kind of call them like classes. So um, each session at a particular time in the day is hosted by a provider, a doctor, and um, every provider has a Zoom link. So that's pre-programmed into the master schedule. Once this um, program list uh, is developed, it can be modified to be turned off, uh, people added to it. And so let's go back to um, the day schedule that gets created automatically. The system goes and creates records from the master. Then it goes and finds all the patients that belong to the uh, that day session. So it could be, you know, yoga, it could be Franken. I call it Frankenstein, but Feldenkrais, pace respiration, and you can go and view who's scheduled for that session. So if you click on this button, you would check in the patients that uh, that you're looking at in the video call. And at the end of that call, the providers and the doctors would go and write notes about that session, that group session. There's also a picture, so you can kind of match up who's in the video, so you can verify that they're attending. So the patient side of it is based on, uh, say we'll take Jane Doe here. Uh, she has uh, treatments that have been assigned to her that are like templated. So let's delete all these and say she's going into a program, FRP program. If you click on this, what it does is it assigns to her all the templated sessions she should be uh, going to. Then you decide what days of the week she wants to go. You can also um, opt her out of these sessions. So that's how you create the records for how the system grabs the patients that go into each of the sessions. Okay, and also the, there's a way to tag that session that they need a, a Spanish in, interpreter. Um, so basically what you do is you create a, a schedule of um, what the patients need, and that could be modified based on the needs. They can only come maybe Mondays and Wednesdays. <clears throat> so the automated system basically starts with the master schedule. It creates records in the daily it then goes and finds all the people that belong to that session that day, and they get inputted. The provider then um, in the video call will be able to check in the patients that they see because the patients on the iPad first check in for the day, and then they have to check in for every session. So the sessions could be three or six sessions a day. And so we then get a signature that verifies that the patient did check in for that session so we can build them. The beauty of the whole thing is that the patient gets a view like this. So obviously it's telling me the patient does not, has not checked into the day. Uh, all the patients have iPads and they first have to check into the system in the morning and then they take, uh, they participate in their sessions. And it's really easy. So based so on the patient side, once they've logged in, they'll see the list of sessions they have to attend that day. And three minutes before that session is to start, a Zoom uh, icon appears, and all they have to do is press the camera icon, and they join that Zoom session. Um, the logistics was, yes, we had to buy 
um, like 100 iPads. Uh, currently, I think we have 500 iPads. Um, and the doctors and providers had difficulty in, in the beginning because they didn't know how to operate Zoom. So we had to fine tune it. So patients would have to go in the waiting room first before they could enter um, a session. And so this is the end result of all that in the sense that this is all the patients see. The providers already in the Zoom room. And they can click on the schedule and get into that Zoom room. And then they can let in the patients. <clears throat> so this was the end product and what made it work. And it, we haven't even changed this in the last three years. So after that week of modifying, creating this, we've done some fine tuning and scheduling because now we have like 400 appointments a day. We've got 135 uh, staff um, and there's four clinics. So it's expanded much more. We started out with five employees and now we're at 135. And when I say we, I'm an independent contractor and I'm kind of winding down this project. Nico? Mm. Yes. Uh, I had a question. Do you have some automation uh, involved in creating all those Zoom sessions? Yes. It's all automated. So, <clears throat> so there's other... You can create other one-to-one uh, -one appointments um, in, a, in the calendar and those get pulled into. So the daily, um, the daily sessions, so let me go back to maybe. So all these sessions are created automatically. So based on the, the master schedule, you know, we have breakfast at eight o'clock to nine o'clock. Um, most of the patients opt in because we, uh, they participate in, in preparing healthy food. So those classes now could be 110 people. Um, then the, it looks at the master schedule and says, okay, what's at uh, 10 to 11? So it creates records in the daily from the master. Then it goes and populates it with the patients that should be attending that session. So all that's automatic. I guess I was asking about the interaction with the Zoom application itself. Do, do you have some kind of API or something to create the sessions you need in Zoom from FileMaker? No, so to I have add, to add to that, um, how are you getting Zoom to auto connect? Well, basically, I've created a, a, a table with all the Zoom rooms with the, the URL and the name of the provider. And as soon as um, that is then put in this database. If you can look at the bottom left, you see that blue Zoom icon that uh, links with the URL, which launches the application. For an application of mine, I've created uh, or used the Zoom API to connect to FileMaker. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, so um, we did start out with FaceTime, switched to Meet, and finally went to Zoom uh, because it seems like the most the easiest. Uh, application and if a patient you know has zoom installed in the uh, the ipad it just launches the meeting directly so to find out where did we leave off uh zoom camera appears um on that line so they know they have to attend the session and all they have to do is uh click on the zoom button and it takes them straight into this uh, Zoom session with the uh, provider, uh, the trainer, the uh, the doctor, and they all join the same room. And the way that works is that each one of the um, providers actually has a, a Zoom room. So each, each one of these sessions is associated with a provider. And uh, if you're a support, you can also just click on the Zoom link and join the Zoom meeting to see if there's anything that needs to be changed and modified. You can add uh, patients to this or subtract them. And again, the screen button here shows um, if how many people are attending. Some of the sessions could be 110 uh, Zoom participants. And as you can see, there's a lot of sessions going on during the day. We have 350 to 400 appointments a day. So, and something else we implemented is we we have now um, 
three uh, dedicated staff to support uh, patients. And so we were using TeamViewer to be able to log into the patients who were having a problem. Uh, we switched now to Splashtop. And I found the biggest issue we had is the iPads we provided with had, had uh, Wi-Fi, but also a data plan is uh, connectivity for some patients is very uh, spotty, depends where they live. That's usually the only reason we have problems with a patient. Um, also, some of the patients have brain injuries, so they're not very technically inclined, um, but our support staff reaches out to them all the time if they see they haven't attended a session. So there's a lot of management involved, texting to them. Um, they also have uh, watches that give us data. We we have an API call for Withings, which takes data from their watches, the scales, and uh, sometimes if they're in the sleep program, there's a pad that goes under the mattress so we can monitor and see what are they doing. Also, um, an example I'm, I'll show you about AI is that the patients, um, so an example, they, they take testing measures like, let's say physical, like can they lift 10 pounds from waist to shoulder? And we create a base record in the metrics. And then every time they get tested again, we have a comparison. So we'll say that they can now lift 20 pounds um, from waist to shoulder. And we show the improvements. Because one thing is we do a lot of an, uh, analytics to see if the patient is improving in all the areas we want them to. Um, most of the patients, or a lot of them are first responders. And so, um, you know, I, I'm really shocked and what jobs they really have to do. It's it's really horrific, a job I would never, never want to do. Uh, anyway, let's see, we've got, I think, a few minutes, a minute left. Um, I will explain um, in more detail. On oh, something else. The patients are color-coded in three colors. So we try and match the patients to a, a physical capability, like for yoga. We don't want to mix a patient that can't even lie down and a patient that's strong so we we pair them with uh, like patients any questions you have well uh, once we've gone through this uh, video okay thank you okay so um you want to start with questions before i go to the next segment which is uh data security and how we were able to um save ourselves from the hack at the uh, triple eight about a year and a half ago well, I want to say thank you, Nico, for taking the effort to scrub all that data. So because I know it's, uh, you know, health information, personal information. So thanks for doing all that. Yeah, it's um, it was difficult to say, where do I go? How much do I have to delete or change? <laughs> and uh, because there's so much interaction, there's actually 180 tables in the solution. So it's a. Uh, it's a big uh, undertaking, and it's been, uh, you know, the medical industry is actually very unique and different, and there's a lot to learn, and uh, the learning curve is kind of high, because our goal is actually to generate automatic reports. So um, let me show you an example of um, what what piece I've taken from uh, AI. So I've written a book. I, published it last week, and it's called um, The Guide to AI Tools. So I'll give you an example is, um, so one of the testing measures is ADL, and basically it tracks to see how well they respond to cooking, cleaning. And so I just asked uh, ChatGPT is, um, can you write a report for Jane Doe based on these results? And it spat out this whole uh, segment. So what I do then is I create um, in our templates for the reports, I go and copy this. And then um, obviously there has to be uh, case statements based on the score that, you know, so it says here, uh, it is evident that she has some difficulty in performing some of the, her daily activities. And it goes down to detail what it is. So based on the score, I have a uh, template in the report section uh, that then does case statements and plugs in the appropriate answer to um, the actual result of the score. And the other um, thing I'd like to show you is 
uh, data breaches. Like, for example, um, uh, you all hear about all the data breaches that are happening all the time. So it's it's a matter of when, not if. So okay, but um, before we move on to that, Nico, can we see if there are any questions about your actual um, solution? Does anyone have any question? Okay. All righty. So you were going to talk about data security. Yeah, well, let's finish this in terms of part of how uh, we can implement AI in, in healthcare. So let's see, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to jump back in. Sure. Come on, let me back in. I tested this last night, but um, anyway, it's a. Uh, I'm going to ask a question. Um, I'm not feeling very well. I feel sad every day. How can you help me? I'm sorry to hear that you're feeling sad. It's completely normal to experience periods of sadness or low mood, but it's important to take steps to address it. Have you talked to anyone about how you're feeling? Sometimes just talking it out with a friend or family member can make a big difference. There are also many professionals who can help, such as therapists, counselors, or psychiatrists. I don't have any friends. I'm sorry to hear that. Making new friends can be challenging, but it's not impossible. There are many ways to meet new people, such as joining clubs or volunteering for a cause that interests you. You can also try attending social events, such as parties or meetups, or even joining online communities that share your interests. Remember, it's important to take care of yourself and prioritize your mental health, so don't hesitate to reach out for professional help if you need it. And any comments or observations? I think the responses are pretty generic, but uh, the pause in generating them, I think is a little concerning. And I don't like her neck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because I've created an avatar for my business and people always have comments. Why is her hair so messy? Or well, her t-shirt, it looks crumpled, you know? <laughs> because um, I've created my own avatar from scratch, but I think this is the beginning, but we don't know where it'll go in terms of, do you have to be a trained AI psychiatrist or therapist? You know, those are the questions we have to ask. It does read the text very well. I'm impressed. It doesn't sound too robotic or mispronounce anything. Yeah, actually, um, I'm having it. Um, I'm hey, using... are you still around? Anything else on your mind? <laughs> um, uh, no, we're done. Thank you very much. What? Anyway. So the uh, <laughs> speech to text doesn't You're work welcome. perfectly. Remember that you are not alone, and there is always help available if you need it. If you ever need someone to talk to, feel free to reach out to me or to a professional. Take care of yourself. Yeah, anyway, so um, let's go to uh, sec da uh, secure data. So um, the container field that has all our medical records in the solution is secure. Um, at times, I kind of wondered uh, because uh, folder now is one has one point five million files in it, because you know that file maker just breaks it into little segments. Uh, it creates some um, random folder names, folder files. So um, what I did is three years ago, I knew that um, our data is insecure. And what is a real solution? Is it adding another? triple authentication, uh, at what point do we stop 
uh, having to add a code that sends via email plus Google's two-factor authentication. So um, Citadel data, and you can go to this link and watch a video, but I'll give you a short demonstration. It's an... Hey, are you still around? Jeez. Anything else on your mind? No. <laughs> um, so let me just close this so she won't interrupt us again. Um, so basically, uh, this is in beta and uh, bootstrapped it. So um, we'll log in and I'll show you how it works. Uh, has anybody heard of uh, IPFS? I think that's a no. Okay. So I use uh, IPFS protocol, which basically the secret source of it is that, um, first of all, I encrypt the file and then I store it on the uh, protocol IPFS, which breaks the the file into multiple pieces and it stores it in multiple servers or computers. And the secret source of it is actually the pointer to the file is a hash of the contents. So let me just add, so uh, if you go and view this image, I think this is a PDF. Um, let's just add a file and you can use your phone as well. Um, So it's encrypting and then uploading into the IPFS network. And here's a file I just um, uploaded. And so for anybody to view these documents, uh, you have to uh, invite them through your contacts and they have to create an account. So you can only view the contents within the confines of the application. So um, does, did you all understand what the secret source of the pointer um, means? Why don't you go over that again? Okay, so <clears throat> if, if um, so normally a file resides somewhere, it, it's on a server in a folder, say it's a JPEG of an iMac. Um, so, the access to that file is through the URL and the pointer is to that URL. With IPFS, um, and if you ever want to study, I've been trying to teach this for many years, um, for seven years, I think. But now what's happening is, I don't know if you're familiar with OpenC and NFTs. But basically, um, all, all files are stored on the actual um, IPFS network. So think of um, uh, a hash is something that's a result of SHA-256. So it could be a video, a text document, a JPEG. It creates a, uh, a encrypted key, which is a hash. And what it does, because the hash is created from the contents of the file, you cannot modify it. You cannot compromise that file. If you try and take that file down or you find it somewhere else and you add a period or you change the, the image, that just goes to junk. So this X-ray file right now resides on the IPFS network. Not only is it encrypted, but it'll always point to this file. It will never point to a, a modified file. So, so where, where is the hash stored? The hash is actually stored in um, the solution. And the um, so IPFS is something, the reason it's called IPFS is it's the interplanetary file system. So um, it's a decentralized storage system. The uh, intent was uh, all the participants in the network would be a, a participant in the storage. So you have, I think it's 20 megabytes of files or or pieces of file on your computer. Everybody participating in the network has a copy of it. There's multiple copies across the world. So the intent was that the more users that join the network um, make it faster because somebody in Japan may be looking at a sh uh, hosted 
file that's in the Philippines and doesn't have to come to the US. So you know how uh, like um, Netflix uses IPFS because they have to create redundant uh, servers with the same content across the world. They can't have people in other parts of the world access the US servers. So IPFS is basically a network you can also spin it up uh, in the medical uh, business. You could also spin it up on your own servers. So it's an internal process. It's not a public one. And um, like I said, it's I'm, I have a company now that I've hired to try and crack it to see because, you know, when humans create something, another human can undo it, isn't it? So uh, in terms of security, does anybody else use... Um, Secure containers in, in FileMaker. Is that a no? I'll say yes. I've used them at least once. Okay. And do you find that the size of the folder just gets too large to manage? Um, I think you could make a case that because uh, my understanding secure storage is uh, local as opposed to distributed across some sort of um, MongoDB architecture, that you might have some scalability issues at sufficient scale. Yeah, because my folder now, I think it's uh, 350 gigabyte for the medical solution. So I've started... Um, adding a script where it gets uploaded to the Google, uh, Google Drive, and it's just a hyperlink to see it in, in FileMaker. The, uh, Nico, the, the implementation that you're talking about, we did a deep dive into container fields when they first came out. Uh, it, it seems that the concept of a hash that's stored local to the data structure uh, is analogous to what you're describing, a locally stored hash. Um, it, it seems like a parallel. And, uh, you know, parallel concepts being employed in both cases with the difference that you're looking for an architecture that scales at big volume. 350 gigabytes seems quite big. Mm -hmm. But yeah, same, same, same technology. It looks like it's similar technologies under the hood. Yeah, it is. And that's why I'm moving to the Google Drive now. So because I'm done trying to back up <laughs> those files because um, we actually, after the... Um, compromise a triple eight uh, a year and a half ago uh, luckily we weren't impacted i don't know why was it that uh, the malware looked at the folder and said wow there's too many files here for me to infect does malware skip over file make extensions um, because i know some people were impacted and we actually moved to a data center here in san diego and uh, we're in the cloud now which has its drawbacks as well you know, VMware is costly and always need additional resources. Okay, if um, there's no other questions, uh, Lynn. Well, um, I was going to ask, do you consider Google Docs secure enough? Or are you, are you just storing your hashes there? Or the actual, what are you storing there? I guess the actual, my question. The actual file. So as the company has grown, um, you know, I was the only person in the company doing all IT, including infrastructure, servers, uh, writing the program. As we grew, and now I think we're 10 people in the IT department, there's other opinions that override what I say. I That's the question I ask is, because everybody says, oh, yeah, it's secure, it's HIPAA compliant. And uh, I think it's just a document they create and say, yeah, we're HIPAA compliant. Um, so, you know, at the top here, it shows all these um, medical institutions get hacked every single day in the U.S. But the problem is that they just get insurance. But I found out from a security specialist that um, starting this year, I think 35% of renewals will be declined because of all the compromises. So um, another thing is backup. You know, is Google backing up our documents if we are relying on them 100%? Uh, what happens if something goes wrong? You know, um, I have three forms of backup. Um, I use, you know, uh, FileMaker backup, and I go to external drive. I have cloud backup. 
obviously we've got uh, VM backup. Um, and actually we did a, a test to um, spin up a new server in Arizona and it did it in four minutes, uh, which was great because that's another concern is we can't be down for uh, long periods of time. We have to be up and running in another server somewhere else within five or six minutes. So any comments or questions or nobody um, has had issues with security? Well, are you using an on-premises server or are you use this? This isn't FileMaker Cloud, is it? No, we're using our own uh, virtual machines in, in a cloud environment at a, it was really strange because uh, we're looking for a new hosting company and I didn't even know across the street from us literally was this data center that's the size of a football field. And uh, they let you co-host so you can get rack space there, you, you can get access to it and just put your own hardware if you want. Um, it was decided that we'd go with uh, virtual machines uh, I still prefer a real server. Um, I've got servers in other locations, uh, Windows servers that have run for three, four years perfectly. Um, and I like the fact that you can just add a, a extra, you know, 10 terabyte drive if you have to, because um, virtual machines tend to get expensive. I, I tested um, AWS, but we were testing it for a month, just me and another associate, and we got a $1,000 bill because they charge you for storage and then traffic. And, you know, FileMaker can get chatty, you know? You're uploading files, downloading files, saving data from a client. And so it, I, I thought it was gonna, it's gonna be so expensive, we won't be able to afford AWS. And I know that Claris is pushing the cloud. Um, it sounds, interesting. I, I don't know if anybody's using Terrace Cloud that much. I just have one client. Okay, Russ Cohn had a really interesting question in the chat. Russ, it's too long for me to read, so why don't you just jump in? Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I, I may not be remembering this correctly, but isn't IPFS uh, it's fully distributed storage on the blockchain. Isn't it tied to Filecoin as a financing mechanism, or is it is it is Filecoin just one of the projects that's using it? Because then there's systemic risk if one of those coins that's providing the financing for routing, transmission, and storage no longer works. Then suddenly people don't want to play in that field, and then what happens to the files? No. So uh, IPFS is um, has nothing to do with blockchain. Uh, it is a protocol of a decentralized storage. Um, Filecoin was created by them to give an incentive for people to store data. The original concept is uh, the network of users would uh, store. Yes. So, so I apologize for interrupting. Um, so are you using your own hardware to store it in multiple places using IPFS or are you relying on this network? No, I, I have uh, an account with Pinata, uh, and basically I pay, uh, yeah, so they're, they're, uh, they, ha they have servers, and you can, they're in Europe and the U.S., and you can spin up as many as you want, and so I use that service. I don't use that uh, uh, in cryptocurrency. Fantastic. Thank you so much for clarifying that. I really appreciate that. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting world because um, I don't know why I get uh, involved with such fu futuristic things where I think 100% of the people I talk to, even in IT, uh, if you know IPFS, and the answer is 100% no. And I know it's being used by companies like uh, Netflix, and is it a secret or is it just not something that has a, a high need at this point in time? Um, but I think the security issues we have with the medical industry are really bad. I mean, most of these medical institutions sometimes don't even report that they get hacked because they don't want to get sued. So um, my PowerPoint presentation for Citadel Data was about scripts. It was a hospital um, in, in San Diego 
they were down for two weeks. They lost $114 million in revenue. They actually then had to pay the ransomware, and I think it was a couple of million. And uh, they went to paper and pen for two weeks. And, you know, there's other instances in, in England where the national health system was hacked and all the women that had abortions or have eating disorders was um, hacked and they, they didn't want to pay for it, so it was put on the web. So all these poor women's information is put on the web. So I think it's a, a, a big problem. And I don't think the solution is... I will say that we build a higher wall and they build a higher ladder. It's a game of tennis, knocking the ball back and forth. Okay, so any other questions about the FileMaker solution? Any recommendations in terms of security for FileMaker? Do you think Claris Cloud is the solution? Well, I don't think anybody thinks Claris Cloud is a solution. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's very few people actually who are using it. <laughs> I know. I have one client that's using it. It's such a hassle. I mean, I, I don't know what I was trying to do is like set up a SSL certificate or something. And and then uh, it seems really slow. Uh, you know, my client, client is complaining that it's so slow. And I thought, my God. So... My um, GMS, uh, the uh, the EM EMR solution I have is now the 49 uh, gigabytes in size. Imagine if that was on Claris Cloud. I think it'd be brought to its knees. Anyway, it's just nice to know other people's opinions because I'm kind of skeptical about it. Is it for the smaller clients, you know, that want something quick and dirty? Uh, use Claris Studio to create a simple solution. Um, like I have a real estate client that has a simple app that just wants to ask questions. And I said, let's just do that on Claris um, Studio to see how it works. And then the question of MongoDB, how reliant uh, are we on MongoDB? Okay. Uh, well, are there any further questions for Nico? Okay, thank you so much for so many interesting topics. Um, we're going to move on to Dave Knight. Dave, are you there? Present. Okay, I'm going to make you co-host and share your screen. You have a tiny tidbit of a bug you found in FileMaker. Um, are you seeing my screen at the moment? Not yet, no. Got it. One second. Share screen. Here we go. Now you are. There you are. <clears throat> um, I'm calling this session Ghost Containers uh, because, uh, or with a you know parenthetical title of Tales of Invisible Disk Usage. Um, you guys all know me. I'm Dave Knight. I'm with Angel City Data. Uh, by the way, this is our brand new logo, which we just trotted out a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I'm going to kind of jump right in just briefly. I'm going to try to make this. This should be a pretty quick little, little demo. Um, we have an art collection management application, a little turnkey that we've had for a number of years called Stash. And it keeps track of uh, you know artworks and collectibles and old documents and maps and things of that nature. We've got it uh, scattered all around. A bunch of different companies use it for, we have an Apache tribe that uses it for preserving language clips with translations. We have it at uh, Planet Hollywood Hotel and Casino where it manages the largest film and television archive in the world. Um, it's a pretty uh, simple little application that keeps track of you know, an asset with one or more images associated with that asset. So we can keep track of a letter and the envelope and all that sort of stuff. So there's not, and, and by the way, you're seeing the gist of the kind of, of tracking. We've got, you know, a handful of notes, uh, some tags at times, mm -hmm. things of that nature, but it's not a tremendous amount of data. And the, the solution itself is really not uh, the, the thing that's at uh, of concern here. It's really more of, let me get this out of here. 
<clears throat> Let me get you back onto, let's get back into Kino. So you kind of just saw a brief glimpse of it, but this is really more of a, let's dig in underneath and, and talk about a particular condition that I found. Uh, and, and just to give you some background, the file itself uh, is uh, built in FileMaker 11, you know, or probably .dot .fmp12 file format. So it wasn't a converted file. There's about 25 tables in there. Um, you, you'll notice as you look at the tables, um, most of the tables in blue, like we have a keyword and a tag uh, category and subcategory. So you'll notice there's very few fields here and only a few records. There's only a handful of records in any of these because they're mostly for metadata or category and subcategory pull down. So there's not a lot. There's there's 20, <clears throat> pardon me, I think there's about 23 of the 25 tables that all have less than 50 records. So there's not a lot of storage there. We have two tables, the asset itself, and then actions or notes about it. And those are the ones that have the largest amount of user data. Almost everything, matter of fact, everything in those two tables, we've got about, you know, we've got about 4,000 records in each of those, and it's all text. Uh, and it's not, and there's no containers or anything significant in size that we're not, you know, copying uh, the entire works of Leonardo da Vinci and then pasting that into a container field or probably a text field. It's largely uh, text data. So from that standpoint, uh, there's not a big deal. The biggest thing of note in the system, you know, Nico talking about containers and storage and so forth, we have an image table in the system and it's got a number of fields. It's got about 10,000 records in there. So that's by far where we want to focus on in terms of storage issues. Pardon me. So that one container, by the way, is stored, uh, pardon me, uh, with remote containers. So we, and, and secured remote containers. So we basically, you know, we don't want to keep those 10,000 images inside the FileMaker file and bloat it up and make backups take forever and all that. So we did remote containers that are, that are uh, secure. And we do use, on occasion, we found that using get as thumbnail calc fields for things like a thumbnail views and a list view actually perform better. So we actually get a little better performance on certain printouts or things where we don't need a high res image. Uh, we can we can tuck that into some container into some calc fields. So this entire solution. You, and by the way, if you guys don't know me, it's like I test everything multiple times. I always save a compacted copy. I'm always you know, I'm, I'm always being really fastidious about uh, what we're measuring. But the compacted size of the FileMaker file was 9 gig. The remote container folder was 18 gig. So when you add those two together, the entire storage footprint for the system is 27 gigabytes. So here's where the mystery begins. Uh, and we're we're looking at a hard drive and a uh, we're looking at a hard drive on a server and going, are we going to eclipse it? We're adding more images. We're going to import a whole bunch. Let's make sure we have enough expansion. So I want to kind of just look at stuff real quick. I mean, grab a backup of the file and I save a self-contained copy. And if you don't remember what that does, self-contained grabs all those containers and shoves them back into the file. So everything's in a single file. Those, those remote containers disappear and everything's back in the file. So doing that and then saving a compacted copy again, the file size uh, is 27 gig, right? When I pull all that stuff back into the file, it should be 27 gig. It's not, it's 18 gig. So wait a sec, there's like moving those images back into the file actually saved me nine gigabytes of storage. And so I'm starting to scratch my head going, well, what the heck? Sure, there might be uh, some additional storage footprint for directories and folders and things of that nature in the remote container version, but it shouldn't be nine gigs worth as far as I'm concerned. So that looked really suspect to me. So this is where I started kind of ex extrapolating and pulling things apart and playing around a little bit. So I want to eliminate things, right? I always want to go, well, let's make sure it's not this, it's not this, it's not this. So what about our non-container tables? Again, we've got 25 tables in there. Only one has containers in it. So I exported all of the 24 other tables. I exported them as just raw FileMaker files, right? Just, just export as FileMaker, grab all the fields, push them out. And the total size of all the other data in the system is only 10 megabytes, which is just a fraction of, of nine gig, right? So, so all of that is 10 megabytes. 
That leads me to conclude it's not the other data tables. I want to just know that it's not a problem. And looking at that kind of confirms that for me. I also <laughs> wanted to ensure that we didn't have layout graphics or something in the schema, something sitting on a layout, something elsewhere. Uh, you know, is there some corruption or anything like that? So let's save a clone of the file. <clears throat> Pardon me. That's six megabytes. So you go, okay, we've got 10 megabytes for the raw data in a FileMaker format. And we've also got about six meg for, uh, for the structure, the, you know, the shell of the database itself. So it's not the schema or the graphics. Uh, I just saved a, 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 a clone and that should kind of dispel that. We also, uh, I did a file recovery. I wanted to double check, is there any damage to the file? Are there any file changes, any hidden corruption, anything like that? Nope, everything came back clean. So this is leading me to believe the structure, the file itself is healthy, the structure is in good shape, all of the other data not really significant. So, you know, that's just to kind of give myself peace of mind. Let's get over there and focus on the containers. So one of the first things, again, I'm working on a copy. I wanted to delete all of those get as thumbnail. We had about four calculation fields that all reference. These are the only fields in the database that reference uh, that container field in terms of generating anything of size. So I wanted to delete those. So I delete all those thumbnails, uh, all those calcs, and I got no file size change. So I'm going, all right, it's not, it's not additional storage caused by those. I even the the um you know the hyper the hypercritical person in me also said, well, let's go in and for uh, containers, when we go under manage containers, you have the opportunity of generating or storing thumbnails. Just for the heck of it, I turned that off. That shouldn't really impact images inside the file. It might go into a temp directory or something, but I'm just like, you know what? Let's turn off anything that looks like it could lead to additional storage. So I turned that off. And again, we got no file size change. So I'm starting to scratch my head a little bit later and I go, okay, and, and by the way, I'm just kind of working with different copies of the file. And this one has images inside and this one has remote container data. So I have a copy of the file that I've done all these things with. I've deleted and so forth. And with the container data uh, set to remote container, I decided, all right, heck with this. I'm going to delete all 10,000 images that are inside this file. This is the big daddy, right? The thing that should be con constituting all of the the file storage and so forth. So I'm getting rid of all the calcs, uh, any sort of thumbnailing, any sort of other stuff, but let's get rid of, uh, so I delete all the records in the container in the asset uh, image uh, table, which is the only file, again, the only table that has containers in it. So I delete that. <clears throat> I close the file, I save compacted again. The file should be about 10 megabytes for those other 24. Uh, tables of mostly text data and about six megabytes for that clone, right? If I can deduct, deduce a little bit, there may be a little bit more than that, you know, some calcs and, and other things that happen, indexing and such inside the file. But, but regardless, it should be in that vein. It's still nine gigabytes. I've just deleted every single container in this entire system. There's roughly 10 megabytes of data uh, when I pull the data out of the file and it's nine gigabytes and I'm starting to go a little crazy here. So I play around a little more and I finally get my aha moment. I grab another copy of the file. I save the contained uh, data, I'm pulling those images back into the file. So now there's just a single FileMaker file, no remote container structures. Now I delete all the container records. The file size goes down from nine gigabytes to 15 megabytes. So that just absolutely spooked me. I was just like, holy cow. If I delete container data when it's stored remotely, I have this nine gigabytes of ghost data that's being retained. If I pull those images into the FileMaker file and delete the exact same records, that ghost, ex, that extra amount of ghost data, that extra storage that's somehow being used is eliminated. What causes this? I don't know. I would love to be able to tell you 
at the root what causes this, but it is something that I have absolutely seen in three completely different file maker systems with different customers. So not even the same solution. I'm going, here's a solution that uses external storage. Here's another one that uses external storage. Wow, it looks to be really big. Let's pull it internally uh, and see if we have that same sort of thing. So I've seen this result in two or three systems. How do you fix it? Exactly what I did. Save a self-contained copy and pull all those um, pull all those images into the file, export all of the container records, every single FileMaker field as a new FileMaker file that just sits out on the hard drive, delete all the container records as a self-contained copy, which is going to, again, get rid of that ghost data, and then re-import all the container records back into the file. File size, when I do all of that, is 18 gig. Um, if I then set the storage to remote containers, after getting rid of that ghost data, the, the FileMaker file goes down to about 22 megabytes, which is completely reasonable. The RC data is 18 gigabytes. And the total size is really just a little more than 18 gigabytes, which is what it should be. So, and by the way, pushing and pulling multiple times after that, going remote, uh, internal, remote, internal, I didn't get the problem anymore. So I can't tell you what caused this, whether it was an early, maybe if you know this thing was opened in FileMaker 16 and there was a bug in 16 that caused all this extra gunk to sit inside a file uh, or wouldn't release it uh, because you're using remote containers. But we saved nine gigabytes of storage space, so our backups were faster. We had we didn't have to increase the hard drive size or any of those types of things because we made a lot of room based on this. And I'm trying to keep an eye on a number of systems that we have like this just to make sure it doesn't happen anymore. So that's the fix. Uh, if anybody has any questions, um, I'm happy to to listen to those. Yeah, Dave, I have a question. So this weekend I was going to compact. Uh, database which is 49 uh, gigabytes and it would go down to 39. So I see all these posts that oh be careful there could be corruption that could delete records uh, so I'm going to each copy and doing a record count in each table to make sure it doesn't delete any of the records. So is it uh, is it compromised if you compact a file make a file does it get compromised in any way? I would say the opposite. First, I would say in, in all my years, I've never seen a compacted copy exhibit a problem that the core file didn't. I've absolutely seen that happen with, uh, I showed off something a couple of years ago where doing a recover on the file actually added a, 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 a circular join in the graph. Uh, but I've never seen a save as compacted if done you know, correctly. I've never seen it add problems. And I generally have felt like, uh, and I've talked with engineers at Claris about this before, things that are about to go bad, you can sometimes get uh, some, some things actually improve, some minor bit of corruption can actually get removed with a save as compacted. Um, Stephen Blackwell. Reading, has this file ever been uh, encrypted at rest or is it now in encrypted at rest? Um, it is it is behind a secure environment. It is not encrypted at rest and has not been. Okay, that's an important consideration yeah. because uh, if a file is encrypted at rest, it can throw off all of the business about compacting uh, and things like that. So, um, and that's straight from the lips of uh, John Thatcher himself. Yeah. Uh, when. Uh, hi, good stuff. Uh, we've seen something very similar in, in many applications. Um, the What we often see that when you look at the recover log, um, there the, the issue is often actually reported, but it's not flagged as an issue. Um, and the recover log can be quite long. So if you, if you look at it and you look for error numbers on the lines, it's actually not reported as, a, as an error. Um, so we actually run it through a, one of our own utilities to flag them. And what we often see is that, that it says recovered um, stranded library objects. And at the end, it'll give you a summary. And that summary can be like gigabytes and gigabytes big. 
on on any solution. So so I wonder if you ran your recover log uh, with that, if it would show up or if it's one of those hidden ones. Um, I've seen, I'm aware of the stranded library objects as well. We've seen that historically and so forth. Now this, we went through the uh, the logs pretty, pretty meticulously, saw nothing uh, of a nature. Um, and again, this, this, if you ask me why this happened, I don't know, because this was handled pretty meticulously edge to edge in terms of, you know, putting on a good uh, authorized environment and so forth. It really just strikes me as and I've seen other customers that have the exact same core templates with commensurate amounts of data that don't have this problem. It strikes me that it, it could be related to perhaps one, you know, this was used with 18.3 and 18.3 had an issue with it, 19.3 does not, et cetera. So I don't know what what causes this issue, but I am aware of what Wim has talked about in terms of this, uh, you know, stranded library objects being a, something where you go, it's not, it's not considered a fatal flaw uh, by FileMaker's uh, recovery function, but uh, we didn't see anything of that nature in the particular logs for this. Okay, any last questions? We're going to go to breakout rooms. Thank you, Dave. That was really very informative. Um, we're going to have two short breakout room sessions. We'll bring you back in the middle and then shoot you out again. So you get to talk to different people, people you haven't seen before, people you haven't seen in a long time. So I'm going to pause the recording. Should be back from their breakout rooms. Welcome back. Hey, Dina. Um, okay, Chris Moyer, ready with your session? I uh, am ready. Going to give us the news of FileMaker and the world, and then we'll have announcements when he's done. All right. Can everybody see this? Yes. Yes. Okay. So welcome to the March edition of the uh, Tech News Roundup. Um, as always, we'd like to give a tip of the hat to uh, uh, Gary over at FM Bug. We shamelessly stole this concept from them. He's done a nice job with it over years. And I just want to give props to him for coming up with the concept. Um, there's a ton of stuff going on, and I ran a little long last month, so I wanted to be a little more curatorial this month and try and keep it focused tightly on stuff that would actually affect what we do. And uh, one of the big ones is the National Cybersecurity Strategy dropped uh, a week or two ago, uh, came out of the White House. Um, they have a bunch of goals, making it costlier to attack the uh, ecosystem. Um, and a big uh, sort of means of them implementing this strategy is pushing a lot of responsibility to providers and data owners, which sounds a little scary to me because, you know, we do nothing if not make software and we act as guardians of data. And so I was looking at this. It's about a 40 page document. Uh, there's a link at the bottom if you want to download the PDF. Um, worth a look. And uh, you could just Google the National Cybersecurity Strategy and see what the, the talking heads are thinking about it and pointing out about it. Um, one of the big pieces is um, generating what's called an SBOM. If you're if you're not familiar with it, it's a software bill of materials. Uh, there was an executive order that came out, I think, last fall, improving the nation's cybersecurity. Uh, and so this is, you know, software supply chain uh, risk mitigation. And the, the basic idea is that if you lean on any open source components or libraries or anything like that, you need to basically have a list of ingredients on the side of your cereal box and say, here's what's in my app. And this doesn't really apply to us. This applies to people who are putting on cloud services and stuff like that, the Calendly and AWS and, you know, Microsoft 365, those types of people. Um, but it's not super clear from the document that it only applies to those people. So I would assume it would apply to something like Clara Studio. They would have to say, here are all the libraries we're using and things like that. So it's interesting in that it may touch our world. This is brand spanking new, so not a lot of it's kind of shaken out yet. But uh, it's interesting. It's something we should probably be aware of. Um, you know, I can imagine, uh, you know, heads of IT, if you're in organizations of any significant size, they might ask you for an SBOM on your FileMaker app. And what are you going to do? So there are tools known as software composition analysis tools that can generate SBOMs, especially if you have, you know, maybe you're using uh, 
web direct or something like that. And it'd be interesting to see what that would make of a web direct deployment. But uh, anyway, just sort of keep an eye on this space. I don't know that there's anything actionable for this group right now, but uh, we're probably going to be seeing and hearing more about this. So uh, that's one thing. That was sort of the, the late news that happened a week or two ago. Tons of stuff going on in the security space. An interesting thing is uh, the one with the NSA. So uh, Wikimedia sued to um, uh, challenge the NSA's uh, upstream surveillance program. Uh, they searched the contents of internet web traffic entering and leaving the United States, including Americans' private emails, messages, web communications. And, uh, you know, they wanted to put a stop to that. And it totally got thrown out on um, uh, national security grounds. Um, you know, the White House is doing a lot of warnings, I guess, lately about, you know, Russia is going to try and uh, up their game in cyber attacks, same with China. And so they, uh, and I believe them, you know, I think these are legitimate threats. And so um, there has been a lot of, uh, uptick in the ransomware activity lately. The war seemed to slow them down at first, and then it picked right back up. Um, this uh, middle article about malware infecting a security appliance. So um, they've attributed this to threat actors with connection to the Chinese government. The security appliance in question is SonicWall's SMA appliance. And the interesting thing is that the malware that they have stays resident in the thing, even if you update the firmware and reflash the firmware. So somehow they figured out a way to keep it in there forever. So if your sonic wall gets infected, you might as well just toss it in the trash because there's no way to get rid of that stuff. Um, the third one just happened uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think, uh, Fortinet. Uh, you know, I have plenty of customers who use Fortinet for VPN access and stuff like that. Uh, that article is from Bleeping Computer. If you search on uh, the Fortinet Remote Code Execution or RCE, um, they have a vulnerability out there that they're dealing with right now. And so I've certainly given the heads up to clients of ours who use Fortinet for access. There's plenty of them. So um, if you have clients who do it, I would give them a heads up as well. Um, there is, um, I don't know if they're a new version of uh, ransomware. And so th this is part of a trend where, you know, Windows has long been the juicy, meaty target of ransomware attackers. And so the latest thing is that the IceFire ransomware now encrypts both Linux and Windows systems. Uh, it's inter interesting because uh, Linux is a bit harder to encrypt because it's not like people hang out on it every day and are doing emails and uh, um, running a web browser on there. It's more of uh, a, a server infrastructure in, in terms of what's its main application. Um, but, um, you know, the article, and this is also from Bleeping Computer, talks about how um, this is a trend where all these uh, ransomware gangs are going after Linux alongside Windows. And it's interesting that they're going after Linux as sort of the, the next tier down from Windows as being a big fat target. So, you know, again, security from obscurity, being on a Mac helps. You know, um, one of the pitches that... Um, um, I don't know if I'd call it a pitch, but words in support of Claris's position about going to a Linux-only FileMaker server, I thought, you know, great, because Linux is a smaller target. And it is a smaller target, but that doesn't make it bulletproof. And so I guess the whole point of uh, me including this in the uh, tech roundup is that uh, FileMaker servers running on Ubuntu are also in the crosshairs of ransomware gangs, so you're not safe it's less likely that uh, it'll be victim to a phishing attack because people don't usually hang out on their FileMaker server um, uh, answering phishing emails, but uh, it's still a target. Um, and then another one is that good old Microsoft Word. You thought you could trust your word processor for Pete's sake, but uh, there's a proof of concept that they're putting out there, like sharing this. I don't understand the logic in this, but the uh, report that they put out has a Python script proof of concept saying, here's how you can create a toxic RTF document that if you open it up in Microsoft Word, you're going to backdoor yourself and open yourself up for remote code execution. So interesting strategy, but um, there are some mitigation steps here, but uh, 
for any of you who use Microsoft Word, heads up, I would uh, look at that. There's um, uh, a couple of possible workarounds here. So configure Microsoft Outlook to read standard email in plain te text format and uh, prevent Office from opening RTF documents from unknown sources. So those are two things, but who likes to read their email in plain text? So that kind of sucks. Um, anyway, heads up on that one. And then here's one that affects the uh, US House members. So, and, and this seems to be a common thing these days where you have you know, a main uh, vendor who has reasonably good security precautions, but then they go and use something like MailChimp or some other third party marketing company and the marketing company gets compromised and they've had to share data with the marketing company. So crypto companies have had this happen to them. Uh, you know, tons of different tech companies. And now the U.S. House members, they had <laughs> getting a weird reverb there. They had uh, their health plan uh, get hacked. And so if you look at the stuff on the right side here, um, this data is already being sold by somebody named Intel Broker on a hacking forum. So it has their first names, last names, social security number, date of birth, home addresses, so all these Congress people and their families have now been completely doxxed by hackers who stole 170,000 records from uh, their medical provider, DC HealthLink. So that's kind of scary. I'm sure that won't affect anybody's, uh, you know, leanings on legislation that somebody may like or not like. All right, enough of the sort of ambient tech noise. Let's uh, talk about clear stuff. So FileMaker 1963 was released February 1. There's uh, release notes here. Um, it's mostly fine tuning. There's some uh, speeding up. Um, I can't think of anything in particular that I'm super jazzed about, but um, it, it's uh, nice that we're, we're getting a, a regular release schedule. Um, Clara Studio also got rev. We actually got two in the span of almost a week here where they did a March 1 release and then they did a March 9 release. This is mostly um, bug fixes. Um, they did some publicly shared views and things like that. Some faster entry and drop down fields. Um, but this is very incremental and it's um, not distressing, but you remember last year between spring and summer, there was a huge quantum leap between here we have this basic form and all of a sudden we have hubs and we have spreadsheet views and we have auto summing tables and we have Kanban boards and stuff like that. And I was accusing Robert Holsey of being a big sandbagger. And uh, the progress has become very incremental now. And so um, it's disappointing. I feel like, you know, the communications have been had where we said, you know, these are the things we need. We got to have alternative means of uh, authentication. We need to have the ability to have a true customer portal where we can, you know, give somebody a link and they can log in and see the progress of their project or invoices or orders or whatever it is, shipping advice. Um, those things would make this thing a hit and would uh, give it uh, wide adoption. And I'm not seeing any significant movement in that direction, which is a bummer. And so I hope they uh, pick up the pace soon. This is feels very incremental to me. Um, in other Claris news, the Claris Council got some new folks in here. I know Wim is here. Congrats to Wim. Um, I don't know if any of the others are on the uh, meeting today, but uh, new Claris yay, Council Wim. folks. Yeah, so yay, Wim. And so I, I sleep well at night. I think... Uh, uh, I, I feel like Wim has similar take in philosophy uh, on issues that a lot of us would. And so I'm happy to have him be the Lorax for us, uh, uh, the Wenzlers or the, the Thneed people. Uh, other announcements, uh, MBS just dropped version 13.1, Monkey Bread Software. There's a ton of stuff in there. Uh, I don't really want to get into it because I'm trying to keep this to 15 minutes, but Go check out the uh, list of features in the new releases. There's a lot there. Uh, DataBuzz is going to be dropping their new FM accounting link uh, next week, they say. Uh, that was announced on the 7th. Um, and then uh, Robert Now, who's actually on this call, um, 
I don't know if you've heard, but in the sort of French speaking FileMaker dumb FM source, which is a long time FileMaker resource going back to the FileMaker 7 and I think earlier days, um, has been around and it just got to be too much of a burden to them. And so uh, Robert created a new resource for French speaking FileMaker developers. And so uh, hats off to him for uh, adding a new resource to the community that's kind of picking up where one that was closing down left off. So that's great. Um, Michael Woods um, released a couple of videos, I want to say a week and a half ago, about uh, a technique he discovered uh, to do custom function patching using add-ons. And so it's kind of interesting. Um, there's two video links here. Um, I think he also announced it maybe on Facebook and perhaps somewhere else, possibly LinkedIn. Um, and I thought it was neat. And um, one of my sort of pet topics is resiliency and high availability and stuff like that. And I thought that fit in well to um, the, a theme I wanted to have for the meeting for uh, next month. And so he's actually going to be on the meeting next month talking about this technique in sort of maybe a little broader context than just the, the method itself. Uh, let's see, uh, this is the list of uh, to be determined upcoming events. So we're still waiting on a free version of FileMaker slash Claris, uh, Engage US or EU, haven't uh, heard anything on that. Um, there's still this purple banner you will see in the Claris community if you wanna register to find out about the free version when it drops, uh, you can sign up to be notified. And then the events that are scheduled out there are .fmp in Berlin, which is a English speaking conference. There's also the Basel conference, which is German speaking, pause on air. The FileMaker Guru Rome FileMaker Week has actually been Italian and English. They have translators there, so you can get some presentations in Italian, some in English, and then you get headsets to where to figure out which uh, language you want to listen to it in. And then engage you in November. And so uh, we actually have a full slate of events. And so while it's kind of a bummer that Claris hasn't really uh, worked out their strategy for what they want to do, I don't know that they need to do anything. There's so many events. I think it's perfectly fine if Claris just shows up at these events and says, hey, here, here's what we got to say and here's an update from us. And so uh, it used to be that DevCon was kind of the only game in town and then Pause on Air came along and was sort of... Uh, ancillary to that, but it was never the main thing, but there's so much content flying around the FileMaker community anymore. And yes, it's great to have DevCon engage as a uh, sort of networking event, but you can do the same thing with a lot of these other events and uh, get content uh, more frequently throughout the year. So it, it's kind of a bummer that they're not uh, getting back into the conference game, but I don't know that they need to. So anyway, that's just my editorial opinion on that. Uh, hitting the blogs, the uh, Claris engineering blog had a couple of February updates, uh, scaling FileMaker server with Docker on Linux. They've also updated their white paper on Linux server. Um, Portage Bay uh, just uh, dropped a new blog post, improved performance in the button bar portal sort header, which is, I believe, a technique that they had had out for a while, but they've just done an update to it. And then a modular date range chooser. And um, that one is also an update to uh, something they had put out before. So Portage Bay coming on strong with two in a span of a month. Uh, Saliant, Wim uh, has his FMS admin tool update for 19.6. And then Beeswax, Alec Gregory uh, did a web UI and JavaScript with Claris FileMaker uh, blog entry, which is nice. And um, I think we'll be hearing more about that in another user group. So uh, podcasts, just sort of seeing what's new out there. So we have um, the... Off the record podcast, some productivity hats that came out on the 7th. Um, the context podcast came out on the 24th uh, with a whole episode dedicated to transactions in 196. Uh, Portage Bay, once again, uh, being super active, revolutionizing uh, FileMaker development with Chat GPT. So, adding to the now voluminous pile of Chat GPT and FileMaker content out there, and of course, FileMaker Talk with Matt and Matt about uh, chat GPT. So that is what's going on and that's all I got. And I'm about two minutes over, so sorry for that. Okay, Chris, it's oh, very- Oh, we, we had uh, another announcement from John, right? Right, John Marquis has an announcement. If you wanna unmute yourself, John. Yes, thank you. I appreciate the time. Um, so real fast, um, I am leaving the current job that I am in. 
um, as of basically the end of the month. And uh, I worked at the Southern <laughs> California. Um, we're getting that feedback. All right. I work at the Southern California Earthquake Center. We run several uh, websites that interact with the FileMaker database uh, through a PHP web interface, um, people registering and so on. Uh, we have a need to both migrate a current site into WordPress while retaining that ability. And also, really, we need to upgrade our FileMaker uh, server um, as it is. We've been sort of tech locked in terms of upgrades because of some other functionality on the website that will break if we upgrade the latest server. So um, there's a whole bunch that to do. And we haven't had a lot of um, help recently because of uh, kind of leftover uh, inertia from the pandemic, not having student workers who have helped in the past and so on. So it's not a full-time job. It would be sort of a consulting or, or sort of project-based kind of opportunity. But if anyone is interested, um, I'm putting in the chat the name of my boss, Mark Benthian, he's at the Southern California Earthquake Center. He is the director of the Communication, Education, and Outreach Office of the Earthquake Center. Um, his email is there. Uh, we're at USC, so that's why it's an at usc.edu address. Um, if you are at all interested, you have expert knowledge in PHP, um, obviously FileMaker, but and older versions of FileMaker uh, uh, 15 specifically, and um, WordPress experience. If you have that and you're looking for this kind of thing, I know this is very narrow, so this probably doesn't apply to 90 something percent of you, but but if you are interested, there's the opportunity. Um, please email him and let him know. Or if you know someone, please pass that email along and explain kind of the situation and he can fill you in with more. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, John. Um, any other <laughs> announcements before we move on? Okay, good. I, I just have a comment for Chris. Uh, I'm a dinosaur. I have never ever used HTML or anything else other than text for email. And I think anyone who does anything different is nuts just because of all those issues that came up. All right, that's all. <laughs> okay, thank you, Roman. All right, now for our big AI. AI is everywhere and will be even more so in our future. So I thought we would bring on a couple of people, Russ Cohn and Nico Tatars, Tatars, um, who have delved into this much more deeply than most of us. So, Russ, I'm going to ask you to begin, and we will have a group discussion um, after these demos. Okay, let me uh, get my screen up. Your screen is up. Excellent. <clears throat> so I'm going to be doing this in two parts. Uh, in part one, I'll talk very briefly about myself and, and how I got to experimenting with AI over the years. And then I'll just take a couple of minutes and then a whole bunch of demos. And then I think Nico will present some stuff. And then uh, with what time that's left, I've got four, three little topics we can go over before we have open conversation. Um, the orientation for this talk is to stimulate your thinking about the realm of the possible and to have us collectively think about, you know, what does this mean to, to us as individuals, uh, to our profession and, and all the larger issues as well. Um, I, I think many of you, I mean, I'm thrilled to see so many old friends on this particular uh, call. It's really great. Um, you know that I've, I've done a lot of work with APIs and data integration um, over the years. And for the last couple, uh, well, maybe 10, eight years ago, I did a whole recommendation system. This was not a FileMaker project, but I did a lot of work in very early um, natural language processing to come up with indexes. And so I had to dive into the math and some of the modeling for very early recommendation engine work where, for the, uh, where when we get to the theory and concepts in part two, I'll talk a little bit about that, just very high level. So you understand how this relates. Um, and then the last couple of years, it's been, well, what do we, what do we do? Um, I've been re watching a lot of YouTubes and, and trying to keep up with it. And like, well, how is this really going to apply? It's not really here yet. And I don't know if I believe it. And I guess I don't need to worry about it. 
And then mid-December, I came down with COVID and had nothing to do and could not work productively on any client projects. So I figured, all right, this is the perfect time for me to take a look at what this open AI thing is and let's take a look at the API. And I kind of was blown away at first. It was like, holy cow, this thing could do everything. And I started having uh, I'm probably saying things that many of you have experienced. You spend hours arguing with it or or trying to come up with some understanding of what it what it is. And, and, and you treat it like a black box. If you poke it this way, what does it do? If you poke it that way, what does it do? And and then it was like, okay, well let me let me uh, let me see if I can wire it up to FileMaker and uh, and see what that's like. So I was able to do that and I created a little chat interface and started um, treating it like chat. At the time, the chat API wasn't out, so I was using text DaVinci 3, which is one model, and uh, it, it began to learn, well, hmm, it's not as infallible as I thought at first. So if, if you think of the old, uh, you know, famous graph that we've all seen before, you know, I went through the period of going, oh my god, this is amazing, and, and then, oh crap, this thing is useless. We're not going to be able to do anything with it. And now I feel like I'm about here. And I expect that, you know, there'll be this long curve of improving our our capabilities with the system. And so I'm, I'm going to try and share what I've learned uh, about some of the some of the possibilities. So I've got eight really quick demos, I hope. And uh, earlier this morning, uh, it was actually down. Now, keep in mind, OpenAI released the API for the... GDT 3.5 dash turbo model, which is the chat GDT model last week. So uh, everything you see here is stuff I put together in like the last couple of days. So here's a little, you know, FileMaker interface. And uh, so let's just see here. You know what, it'll probably be faster if I copy and paste this, right? So, um, and if I hit tab, it should go off. And it basically says, uh, let's see what it came back with. So this is exactly the experience that you would get, kind of get, and my uh, my FileMaker is corrupted, I believe, because this uh, text formatting isn't working the way it was yesterday, and now today it's not. If anyone has a clue on why text formatting would change, this is supposed to be bright white. Um, anyway, uh, uh, we could ask another question um, like, uh, uh, what are some of the tasks you can accomplish? So this is a very simple application building in a chatting capability to the native uh, model or any model for that matter. And so these are all sort of things you've probably seen if you've been reading about this at all. Um, I think I will shrink that so we can see more of it. Um, and then, uh, uh, yes, uh, but doesn't it take a lot of expertise to make that all happen? Or is there an easy button? And what I'm getting at here is to start looking at the characteristics of the responses that are coming back. Okay, so here, let's take a look at this. Okay, so here it's going to give some very generic response about there being, you know, APIs and SDKs and so forth, which, you know, is not exactly easy for a lot of people to integrate with. Um, although uh, most of us here could probably deal with it. Um, 
But um, in, <laughs> when I did that query uh, last night, it said uh, use a FileMaker plugin or add-on to make this work. And of course, there is no such thing that exists today, which gets to the way these um, machines sort of uh, hallucinate um, uh, uh, answers. So uh, it's very helpful conceptually to, and I'm gonna reiterate this, that we don't think of these machines, these models, these large um, language models as databases. And they are not search engines. They're a whole different thing. And it's really helpful for us to keep thinking about it as a whole different thing rather than something we're really familiar with. So they work really well with search engines. They work really well with databases, but they're their own, they're their own thing. Um, and of Ross, course, you can I have a question. Yeah. In a session, do they store your? I will uh, address that. Okay. Memory. Uh, the whole issue. Yes. yes the whole issue of the whole issue of context and memory, and 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 it gets to the side. I'm going to address that in part two, and if I don't, please make sure I, I cover it. Um. Um. But like at the at the moment, I am submitting this entire history of messages with each query. So it's building up a memory of what this conversation has been about, which is a perfect segue actually to like, here's where we can start doing things where I could say set title, which is a function I've written into this particular FileMaker file, where the handler that's being called on the event when I, when I exit the field is gonna detect that the text of this global is set title and it's going to do something different. In this case, it's going to create a very structured query to ask it to try and generate a project name or a title for the conversation and a summary, return it as JSON so that FileMaker can parse it and put into these fields. Now, this works about half of the time at the moment. Sometimes it comes back with like extra characters or strings that make it non legit JSON. So let's see how lucky we are with it today. See, it gave me the string output, which, um, you know, if my code was able to strip it properly would, but you can see it did come up with a, an interesting title, right? Integrating with learning from your pro developers, right? And the summary, blah, 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 blah. So that's actually not a bad outcome but there's a lot of work to be done to guarantee that the structure of the result actually conforms to what you're looking for. Now, I probably could improve the prompt by giving a lot more examples of what I was looking for so that it would have more, um, uh, more opportunity to, uh, to work with it. Uh, let me go back to the list here. So, in fact, let me go to here. So that was integrated chat and this concept of um, structured responses. Uh, let me, uh, let's do a couple of uh, formatting and sample uh, data examples. So, uh, oops, uh, hello. Let's go back to the list, let's do a new chat. I would like you to create 10 sample address records for the uh, for the United States that cover the range of typical address formats. And I have a misspelling here. We'll see if it handles that. So it came up with some, some addresses. Okay, and now I'll say, great. Now please provide, I'm still polite to the machine, even though you know it really doesn't have feelings. So I'm gonna ask it to render it as JSON and I'm not giving it a specific JSON format. I'm gonna let it come up with its own structure, which you know, may or may not be what I actually want. We'll see if it can do that. And there it is, which is 
pretty compelling. And then um, I'm going to copy and paste the next couple of quotes because my fingers are cold. And I'm not. This says, create an outline of a reliable way to parse this JSON data using JavaScript, using best practices. So this is where we can get into the, uh, you know, can it help us in our code writing? Can it give us suggestions for how to do things? Um, Notice it's thinking a little longer. So I'll put in a variable. I didn't say anything specific about, you know, FileMaker, right? And uh, this keeps going, by the way. Um, and it's probably not a bad, we could look at the, the full thing if we really want. Here it, whoops. Um, that's the full text of it. So, I mean, we could read through this and chances are it's not going to be the most optimal way. It may be missing some stuff. There might be some small errors, but as a starting point, certainly not, not bad. All right. And now let's try one more task where what I'm writing here, summarize the steps without the details and render that summary using markdown syntax without any additional commentary. So I may copy and paste that directly into a markdown editor. And for those of you who don't know, Markdown is a very simple tag, uh, tagging environment. To, it's kind of helpful for simple outlines and stuff. So let's see if it actually did it. Uh, let's see. No, it did not. Um, so let's see here. Um, uh, try again using mark down syntax. I may have to give it some more examples. It may have this. Uh, so the human in the middle is, I think, still a major factor here. Let's see if it did this time. Nope, didn't. Well, it did yesterday. <laughs> so um, this is where uh, let me try changing the temperature and we'll try it one more time um, and say render outline and I'll explain temperature in a minute in mark down syntax using eggs appropriately. Maybe that'll nudge it. Ah, here we go. Let's see. And if I go into, oops. So here's a, a markdown editor. So that's helpful when it works for documentation, for uh, brainstorming. And, and, and you can imagine that if we come up with uh, some driven process from FileMaker mediated data, you know, we have the ability to create these types of, of things. So both on the creation side for us as a tool and potentially as a, a form of output of um, our systems for certain use cases, stuff like this is really good. Um, I'm gonna delete that. And uh, let's, uh, let's try translate the markdown into Spanish. Ah, okay, this is where one of the other things comes into, into play, which is that there's a certain size limit that the memory will take. Now up here, I have the response tokens, which is one of the options that you have. That's how big a reply are you asking it to give you? And the total number of tokens, token you can think of as like a stem of a word. Some words are multiple tokens, some words are ignored, but it's roughly the number of words. So this conversation with all the different prompts and everything is now up to you know 2041 and 
uh, we're going to exceed the limit of 4096, which actually gets to Lynn's question from earlier, which is how much memory does it have? And it has a memory of 4096 tokens, I think, give or take. Um, so I'm going to change this to uh, 500. And uh, because this demo file is uh, not an end user uh, yet ready kind of a thing, I'm just going to translate the markdown into Spanish and try it again. Your response token uh, went back to 2048. It did, didn't it? Thank you. All right, it's 500. Translate into Spanish. All right, that time it's working. So this same limit applies when you're using the chat GDT website and you know, you're talking away and suddenly uh, yeah, you ask a question and no longer you know, remembers. Uh, I don't, my Spanish is not good enough to know whether or not this is accurate. Does anyone wanna pipe up? Sure, it looks good. So, so I've covered integrated chat, structured responses, formatting of sample data, and translation. Um, any immediate questions? So when you switch it from 2048 to 500, that seems like a decrease, or does that, does that do a reset? Does that give you another 500? Uh, sorry, maybe I wasn't clear in how I explained it. That, uh, and I'll, I'll talk more specific, well, I guess we'll cover it now. Um, you have a total of 4,000 and change tokens for the query and the response. The query in this case for chat is the entire history of messages that you've had. Um, what I'm doing is I have a, a, a sort of a, a child table that has the individual messages and responses. And so I'm basically assembling the prompt by traversing the record set of the children message records to assemble the, the query. So when you combine, sorry, everyone in LA County or Ventura County is now getting a emergency alert. Um, uh, so you, you take that and you add it to the response. You have no control, well, your prompt, you can control by the size of the prompt. What, what chat GDT or uh, text da Vinci three or any of these models don't know is how much of a reply they want to, you to, they want you want them to give back. So that token count that I changed is how big a response I want back. So I said, don't give me anything more than 500 characters. I'm uh, sorry, 500 tokens. So it's not the, so, so originally I was saying, give me 2000, which meant my prompt could be 2000. By requesting 500, my prompt can now be 3,500. Did that make sense? So 2,500 plus or 2,048 plus 500, how do you get 3,500? No, no, no. There's 4,000 all together. So the okay. 500 is subtracting from that. So okay. you, you, you take 4,000 and change, subtract the size of the token that you're asking back, and that what's left is how big your prompt can be. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so let's try another type of thing, which is, uh, here's another hack I did where if I type the string image colon, and then, you know, some sort of prompt here. So now instead of going to the completions endpoint for chat using the chat, uh, the GDT 3.5 turbo model, in this case, it will be hitting the slash images endpoint and using the Dolly 2 image generating model. And my code, if it works, will be able to detect, uh, well, of course it would help if I was in the field. Um, can detect that it, that an image came back and then do something different than um, 
so in this that first query was was basically creating it and there it is so that's very much in the parlor trick realm of of uh, activities but i mean i could see in certain use cases you might want to create a sketch of something or automate maybe a uh, 100 ideas about something and database them all you could you know write a clever query that, that creates your um you know your uh it creates the prompt so in this case my my image colon trapped for my code in filemaker to insert a pre-written larger image prompt at to which it appended the the input string that i put on i also asked it to like what what i could do to improve the prompt so here it gives me a, a modified prompt okay although i've noticed in many cases the modified prompts it gives you gives me back are too long for dolly 2 to actually accept so just because both models are by OpenAI doesn't mean that they understand the limitations of the other models. <laughs> um, let's try uh, another idea, which would be, uh, so this was actually a real world situation um, where, let's see if, I don't know if you can read that. I would like assistance in drafting an email response to a vendor. We made an inquiry several weeks ago regarding API integration credentials and sandbox onboarding without a substantive response. I primarily need primary technical contact person's name, email, and phone, and confirmation that the email has previously covered the required information, right? And normally I'd spend 15 minutes trying to figure out how to write a proper email that doesn't piss people off because I'm annoyed. Um, and so let's see if this can help with stuff like that. And so here's what it came back with. Not perfect, but I could work with this and probably, um, I actually did this a few days ago and it probably saved me, you know, at least five minutes, maybe more. But, uh, you know, for, for those solutions that we have where we're supporting our customers sending emails rather than building complicated email formatting modules, uh, you know, we can now leverage technology like this to help with the creation. Um, I think for a while, we're still gonna want the human in the middle to proof it, um, but um, that's always the case with these sorts of things because there's usually a little tweak that needs to be done. Um, okay, so now let's get to something that's a little bit more heavyweight. This is actually a real project that I was asked to do uh, last week. Um, so this is a vendor classifier. So here's another use case, which is classification, where you're going to use an artificial intelligence model to try and classify records in some way. Now, using statistically valid neural language processing stuff, you can get very formal about it and, and validate that your model works really well. This is, a, is not that. This is a very lightweight classification mechanism, but we were testing it. Let's see if this works. So here's the, the, the use case, which is where you know, my client uh, sends a lot of requests for quotes to their vendors. And it's a small family business where a few key people know all the vendors, but they're now hiring some people who don't have the many, many, many years of experience in the field, and they want to find ways to help them. So they started off with the manual tagging of, um, of vendors with a, what they called scope, where, you know, a, the type of product or something, and then in a, a products category where they, and of course, you know, what usually happens, no one could be bothered to actually fill that all out. And, uh, or they're very vague with what they put in it, or they're using different words to mean the same thing, and there's no consistent taxonomy of how it works. So we decided to develop a taxonomy of the categories that are needed, which is relatively small, maybe 20, 25 categories is all we really needed. Then we would scrape the vendor data uh, off the web pages for the vendor's website, 
And to begin with, we said, you know what, let's just try using the metadata fields on the pages. Let's not even worry about looking at the content. Let's look at what they, what their marketing people decide to put into the page title and the description. And if they bother to put keywords in, let's lift those and start with that and see what we can come up with. And then let's ask uh, the AI to come up with the best fit. So if we give it the taxonomy and we give it the, uh, uh, the vendor data, maybe it will come up with a classification. So here is, I don't know if you can read this. So like these are real companies, right? So we could enter the, and this test data is going against the classification mechanism. So this is to test the thing. Eventually this will get wired up to their production. So if I say classify that, it's going to go off. It's going to take that bit of JSON and it's going to say, okay, this company is in quality control. Someone has a active mic. This one says raw materials and distribution. This one's got uh, a primary and a secondary. And obviously this, you know, I'll be scripted and, and you know, put into whatever, you know, a data entry mechanism when they're updating vendors. So we now have, and, uh, you know, we've done this for, we've spot checked about two dozen records in the client's database and had people take a look at the results that were coming back. And they were like, yeah, we could live with this. This is pretty good. Um, behind the scenes, this is sort of like a log of, um, you know, just eventually it's, this is, you know, what's being uh, done. And over here in the settings, I created a JSON model for the taxonomy and then wrote a fairly comprehensive prompt to uh, do the work of figuring out how to make this work. And I used a combination of my own work and, and um, chat to come up with the taxonomy by feeding it a bunch of data about the different vendors to figure out, well, what's the scope and, and did some research on it and so forth. So this took, you know, a few days, you know, a couple days, two, three days of work to figure out, uh, but we're now able to solve a problem that, you know, otherwise would probably not have either not been solved at all or would have taken a, uh, some employee many, many, many hours to go through the, the vendors to, to figure out. Um, and then the final example I want to give is a chat UI to FileMaker query where, uh, and I've limited this to, um, if I type the word query, I've limited this to, to looking within this file itself at the moment. So I'm gonna type a search phrase in natural language, have the AI translate that query into a structured bit of JSON and have FileMaker read that bit of structured bit of JSON and perform a, FileMaker find requests based on that structured data, differentially going to the right table or not. Um, could also do this with SQL, um, but I'm doing it with just standard FileMaker within a script environment. Uh, and again, this is more of a proof of concept about providing natural language front ends to our data solutions. Um, so show me pictures of bears. I think that will work. And so it so happened that, uh, you know, when I was first playing around with it, I was doing a bunch of uh, experiments with Dolly 2 to come up with uh, combinations of um, Paddington bear and Winnie the Pooh, right? Figuring out how to, what, what environments they'd be in. Notice this query also found an image I did on a, a machine shop that has bearings. <laughs> so it's a the text phrase bear, it matched to all of these. There's no, context, at least in this query, there was no contextual separation to indicate that this image is not a bear. Because of course we're doing the find in FileMaker and FileMaker doesn't have that understanding. Now, if we had, taken every image and run every image through an image pattern recognizer and tagged it that way, then the query would have been a lot more accurate in that regard. 
But I find this to be really exciting in terms of being able to provide some really cool front ends to our, our systems. And we start adding the um, you know, speech to text stuff and the other things, you get these different layered effects. So that completes my part one rapid whirlwind uh, uh, demos of what I've, you know, kinds of things I've been doing with them um, with AI lately. Hey, uh, if it's question time, I got one. I, uh, Russ, I dropped something in the chat. Um, just a true story, a uh, couple meetings recently, uh, put them up on YouTube. YouTube generates a transcript. Transcript comes back in two different formats. One of them is like a gigantic block of text, no paragraphs, no white space, no bullet points. The other is a timestamp links, very short snippets of text. Um, not, neither one particularly usable in terms of producing the output, which would be either training document or, you know, just something that's usable. So that's the setup. True story. Is there uh, any AI whereby you could uh, give it uh, one of the following tasks and listed in sequence of uh, simplicity and usability? Say, hey, AI, here's a giant blog of text. You're pretty good with the language modules or models or whatnot. Can you like format this in an intelligent fashion uh, and save me the trouble of putting in paragraphs and bullet points and so forth? Or uh, version two for extra credit, can you can you give it back to me as that HTML or Markdown, uh, possibly with hyperlinks derived from the timestamp links provided by YouTube. Or finally, and this is the last one, uh, can you give it back to me with the text? I don't want you to change anything because we're going to put human intervention in the middle. Uh, give it back to me as per YouTube because I don't want you to muck it up. And But give me suggested annotations, possibly in some sort of format similar to what Google Doc gives you the ability to have suggestions. Is that possible uh, with the current technology? Uh, maybe. Um, the big limitations that I see at the moment, and I apologize, I've lost my chat window uh, with all the other windows I have open here. <laughs> so, um, but uh, you have the limitation of the 4,000 words to begin with, right? And if you want a response, that has to fit. So you're limited to about 2,000 tokens on the initial input. So there are different strategies I've just begun to play with. Um, remember where I put the dot on the Dunning-Kruger graph? I'm still pretty far down in the pit of despair because it's like a lot of these things that we want to do are almost, but not quite. And we have to figure out how that's going to work. Um, uh, but, but yes, I mean, you can give it text and it will summarize it. You can give it text and reformat it into different uh, aspects. When you want to restructure things, if you tell it exactly how you want to restructure it and you name all the components in some sufficiently accurate way, especially if you give it several examples of what you're trying to do, then it does a decent-ish job of, of doing that. And I expect that stuff will only get, get better. Um, ah, I got my chat window. Uh, all right. Anyway, I don't know if does that make... Um, sense yeah no it, it, that's useful and uh, four thousand words and you know i'm 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 a beginner and that's appreciating the presentation and i'll just uh close my comments here by saying that this is functionality that would have potential usefulness for the file maker community where there's so much awesome content being produced by you know people like this presentation and uh you know leveraging it by getting into a usable transcript format um and i also have some uh non file maker uses for it. So thanks for the presentation. I'm having fun. Excellent. Thank you. So Heidi, I gave you your image here. Alan, when you ask ChatGP to create a file maker script, how easily you get well, first of all, you know, you have to make sure it is actually an accurate script. Um, I've done some tests, some things, things where there's, okay, this gets back into the theory side of it. So I, uh, uh, I think I'm going to hold off on, on that, Alan, I'll, I'll come back to that. How are we doing on time, Lynn? Uh, good. I'm, I'm 
willing to stay as long as people are interested in listening. So we've got as much time as we need. So Nika was going to do some talk as well, and then I could come back and do the theory, or I could keep going. It's whatever, whatever you guys want to do. Yeah, can I throw in my two sets? Um, I've got some responses to the, some of the questions, and I can show you something maybe that can help people. Um, can I share my screen, Lynn? Yeah, yeah. I just stopped sharing, and yeah, and just yeah, go I've... ahead, Nico. You can share. Okay. So a couple of things, which is I tend to be a playful, more of a playful person than a serious person. <laughs> um, just if you want to know that I have um, on my site, myNTI.com, uh, there's a button here called AI, and I've integrated the API for ChatGPT for you guys to test it out. Um, and you don't have to create an account right now. You can just uh, click on this, and it's got a simple interface. So if anybody wants to try it out, you can go there. Um, and let's start with um, the path I took. So I created this avatar for my business. If you want to listen, it's just a 40 second video. Miss Sim, Miss Sarah, and welcome to our website. We have been providing technology solutions for over 30 years to businesses. We build amazing apps and offer turnkey solutions. This means we build your technology infrastructure, custom software development, purchase decisions, training, and support. One of our new additions is artificial intelligent consulting and training. We say humans will not lose jobs to AI. They will lose their jobs to people that adopt AI tools. Contact us to schedule a free 30-minute introduction call so we can review your needs. Okay, so that's my avatar. That's my first attempt. I used four different uh, AI programs, nothing to do with ChatGPT. Um, and I created that image using uh, Midjourney. So I wanted to take that text I saw in chat and see what image uh, it would create. So um, these are high-res images, and uh, it's it's kind of amazing just to watch this because you feel like you're on a trip, you know, an imagina imagination trip. Uh, let's see, and you have to keep track of your question. Yeah, Midjourney is interesting. The this this Discord interface to it is is cool. Um, the API for it's also pretty interesting. Um, it's fun to look at the difference between uh, Dolly two and Midjourney and some of the others. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny watching people's imagination uh, getting created as you as you watch. I mean, the stuff that people ask for is just almost, I think amazing i mean do we need artists in the future uh where's my hacker question yes we absolutely need artists <laughs> <laughs> no this brings a lot of conversations like intellectual property um, who owns it is it the ai is the person asked the specific questions all these uh, things come up um oh, so here here's the Here's the prompt for the hacker. It's a little different. Okay, so now let's go to um, what I use uh, ChatGPT for every day and how I found it very compelling and useful. Um, and basically, uh, I use it every day for a lot of questions. So some of the uh, questions I asked previously is, um, Oh, give me a list of all the uh, uh, CLI commands for FileMaker Server. So it gave me these um, 22, and then I said, uh, give me more detail, uh, I'll run a schedule. Um, so here it gives you the, the detail, and when it writes code, it gives you a button to copy. So you can ask it, you know, uh, copy this and paste it. Um, because I find that when I ask questions on Google, it starts me on a journey of the next search. So one thing important to remember about ChatGPT 
is the prompts are actually more important. It's like they say, if you ask the wrong question, you get the wrong answer. And there's um, people like me and others that are actually selling uh, prompts. And some of the prompts I did prior to this is, um, uh, I'll do one. This, this is what convinced me that this has arrived. So uh, write a uh, write code in PHP to create a contact database with SQL and CRUD. Oh, so sometimes it times out, so I have to copy and refresh because I let it uh, sit dormant. Uh, I have a, paying, a paid account, so usually I don't have any uh, issues with getting immediate response. So I tested this and it actually works very well. And this is what convinced me that we've arrived. Some of the other things I use um, it for is like uh, this past weekend, I had to write a business plan. So I asked it to write a comprehensive business plan and you can be specific about it and even gives you your competition. It's it's. I think amazing. And if you kind of use it as a useful tool in the sense that know what you're asking. Um, so let's say uh, write a compre. And oh, by the way, you can use it. So when I'm writing my book, um, as English is not my first language, and I never thought language was important. I, I, I focused on, on engineering and, and uh, and I, I do paste in a, um, sections of my book and I tell it to look for, uh, for errors or I tell it to fix the grammar. So I'll tell health care. Oh, it even corrects the uppercase uh, M. <laughs> That's funny. So it starts out with the executive summary and what I did is I took each section and I um, I told it to expand, like what's the target market, um, what's the strategies. So think of it as a conversation. So it remembers what you asked the first time. And if you keep on saying, elaborate on something like uh, target market. So I think this is a, a good way to start. And, you know, for me, if I'm writing a script, like I was working with uh, repeating fields the other day and I couldn't remember how to get the value. So I wrote it and it sped out the code for me immediately. Um, more detail in target market. And obviously emails, all those things are really cool. There's some way to automate all that if you want. So here's an example of how, how it can help you with your day-to-day -day business as well, not just the, the file maker development, because obviously we are all business owners to begin with. Are there any uh, questions? I have a comment. My husband's a writer and he's been using this. He's been trying it out to help with um, searching for allusions in the writings. Uh, he had a, a phrase from a Sherlock Holmes story and he asked chat GPT to see if that phrase appeared anywhere else. And it found the phrase in an autobi or a biography of Benjamin Franklin and a quote from Umberto Eco. 
So that was useful for him. It gave him a place to start on his research um, on that specific phrase. So I thought that was really clever. Yeah, in, in my book, um, I, uh, I cover all the different industries and basically one of them like is education. So my 11 year old son was told a month ago not to use chat GPT for his assignments, okay? And uh, in my section of the book, um, I state that we should use this as a, as a tool. Just think of it as an add-on. Don't make it a, a bad thing to do. It's, it's, it's okay for them to use this as a tool. So uh, recently, I think last week, they said now, um, oh, by the way, um, you can now use chat GPT. So do we use... Do we still keep our critical thinking and say this is just another tool that we can use? I think that's the approach we should do. Um, so here's part of my book. If we go to the, so I, I take each industry, you know, agricultural, um, where's education, e-commerce, uh, oh, legal, like legal stuff. It's it's amazing. I I wrote, um, I told us to write a um, a demand to an insurance company. So I know this is beyond the scope of FileMaker, but I think once you start using these tools to kind of like um, develop your your skill set, uh, like I say in the title of my book, it's um, AI won't repa replace your job. It's people using AI that will replace your job. And I think that is a valid point. I know to some people it's scary, um, but it shouldn't be. Although this image in my chapter of education <laughs> is kind of kind of scary. Um, and my son complained that Alice was on the screen just moving around waiting for me to ask a question. He thought that was creepy. Um, so I, I talk about like, you know, students are already using ChatGPT. Uh, ChatGPT uh, took a, a medical exam and a bar exam and passed it. So all the educators are wondering, oh, hang on a second, you know, what's happening? And look, this is out of the bottle now. There's no turning back. So anyway, if there's no more questions, I'm uh, kind of done with what yeah, I'm Yeah, Russ, saying. thank you, Nico. Um, Russ, you had, we were going to go back to theory. Uh, sure. Nico, can you stop sharing your screen? And thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, um, in fact, it's a perfect uh, segue, I think. Are we back? Yeah. So part two. Um, so if you haven't done anything with any of these tools yet, you know, where do you start? So I, I created a little to do list for everybody. Um, you can go to platform.openai.com and set up an account. Um, you'll need to get some credentials and an API key if you want to um, integrate it in with FileMaker. The playground there. Um, Maybe I should just show people. Um, platform openai.com. So you get to this page. And so here you can read up on the different things. You can see the full documentation of all the different um, guides and the full API reference when you get to doing that. You can look for examples in all sorts of different use cases, which are quite interesting. And the first place to go is probably the playground, you know, where you could basically play around with it. And then if you're looking for chat GDT, you can just click here and go to chat. Now, when you start with the free version of, of chat GDT, uh, you are not given the highest priority in terms of whether uh, uh, there's if there's not enough capacity, it will say, sorry, we're busy. <laughs> um, uh, and when you pay, you get higher availability. Um, and uh, uh, it costs about 20 bucks a month to get the higher availability. Uh, I, I paid for it last month to kind of see what it's like. Now that I've got uh, my own chat interface to it, I may, I may skip paying for it because <laughs> I'm getting the same effect directly out of FileMaker. Um, but this is a great place to start experimenting with, with this particular model. 
And there are other models out there. I mean, it's not just all open AI. Google's got, was it Bard? And there's a whole laundry list of other ones that are coming. And um, I think I even heard uh, yesterday that uh, GDT4 might be released next week. So um, it's, it's change is happening very, very quickly. Um, if you wanna do, uh, um, uh, oh, they also have a Discord server, which has um, a lot of enthusiasts on it. Um, but occasionally you can find some interesting conversation and it's also a great place to, if you ever into the image generation stuff, people are, uh, they have a daily contest. So you can uh, try your, your hand at writing prompts. It's a, it's a great way to kind of learn the ropes of how, how prompt engineering might, might work. So the theory and concepts, uh, are, uh, <clears throat> um, I'm gonna try and be pretty broad here. Like I said earlier, they're not databases and they're not search engines because they've been trained on a very specific set of data only. That's what they know. A search engine crawls the entire internet. Most of these systems have not crawled the entire internet or if they have, they still haven't necessarily processed it all or been trained on it all. These uh, large, large language models, the ones that, that we were working with are formally text completion engines where they're hunting for the next best word. And uh, the best way for me to conceptualize it is to think that they're hallucinating freely. And as a result, they're incredibly convincing about what they are saying, even if it's completely wrong. Uh, as an example, I was going on a little trip a month or so ago, and I wanted to get some help in finding what to do. So I figure, hey, these AIs are out there. Let me ask it for the like best hike in the area, the best restaurant in the area, and uh, you know any important tourist sites I really should see and to give me a nice write-up and, and if there's ratings available to, to present them. And this thing came back with an absolutely beautiful presentation that looked fabulous of entirely made up locations completely made up links and completely useless. But if I didn't know, if I didn't validate it, I would have believed it because it looks so good. And so this is something that we're gonna have to um, struggle with both uh, in, our, in our own implementations and I think as a society, because I think a lot of people are gonna fall for the convincingness of, the, of all this. As a result, if we were trying to leverage the power of a large language model for a, which is inherently subjective, right? Anything that's subjective, these things are quite good at. When we get to objective things, it gets hard. And so getting that to behave is gonna be part of the process. I think we saw in, the, in part one where I tried to get it to title the, um, the, the chat. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't because the JSON that came up with, sometimes it adds extra commentary, even though I told it in the prompt, do not add that extra commentary. Now with the right amount of training, it would know not to do that. Um, we talked a little bit before about token count, which is the size of the memory. And so like in the playground or in the chat interface, chat TDT interface on their website, uh, when you exceed the 4,000 characters, it doesn't tell you you can't keep going. It just forgets everything prior to that. So if you have a long enough single conversation, think of it as like a window that's moving through time. Um, your, 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 your memory only goes back, its memory only goes back so far. And when it, it provides very long responses, it makes it harder for it to remember the stuff that's earlier. So if, if you really want to, you need to start a new conversation or just know that you've exceeded that limit. Um, the one advantage I found with uh, writing it in FileMaker is that it actually errors out. I mean, I get a blank response. I know, oh, I've exceeded the limit and I'll eventually code around it. I'll probably write some stuff to self-modify the, the token count response or prompt, hey, do you want to reduce the token count size or hey, you're getting close. Um, 
the things like that. But there's still a limitation um, because we really want to take a ginormous amount of information, feed it to it and say, hey, tell me what's going on here. And you have to give it bite sized chunks to really make it work. The temperature is is like how creative uh, do you want it to be? Um, I think uh, you think I, I change it at one point to point one for a constrained response. Um, I typically use point five. It seems that's what they've recommended and seems to be working. Um, and who knows with with different builds, it may change. Now the following will be for the few of you who care about this. The rest of you can sort of doze off for a minute. I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but basically you get a, a prompt, which is the text that gets submitted, which goes through a bunch of pre-processing stages, right? Where it tokenizes every word, it'll stem the words, it'll scrub the text, it will eliminate stop words. And then with that bit of valid words, it will do a vector generation, which is a mathematical representation of, of that string of tokens. Every single token has a unique dimensional representation in this multi-dimensional vector space that's being used for nearest neighbor matching for creating the next word prediction. So they'll go through all these steps. Okay, they'll then feed it through this neural network, which will say, hey, what other words are related to this? And 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 what clusters of words are related to this? And what and therefore for humans, we may see the cluster of word frequencies in, in corpuses of data as being concepts or ideas, but it's just looking at strings and how those strings statistically match. Okay, and then it will come up with a, uh, a result vector, which will say, hey, this is what we think the next word should be. And now what the next word and the next word and the next word and okay, now I'm done. And then we convert that vector back into output. And they're layering in these filters and safety things now so that, you know, uh, we don't all become fanatics as it it delves into various aspects. The way these vectors are created, the way the matching is done is all the result of model training. And this is what the uh, open AIs and the Googles and the whatnot of the world are doing. And then what's available to us is what's called fine tuning, where we can add additional vectors to the space to help it um, uh, uh, know kind of what we want to do. So for example, my set title function, if I train the model on uh, by giving it say 50 examples or hundred examples of this is a good title, this is a bad title, this is a good title, you know, here's proper, because it, it doesn't really know what JSON is. It knows what those patterns of strings are. And it just so happens that that pattern of strings is close enough that most of the time it works but it doesn't have a formal knowledge of, oh, this is what JSON is. It's a subtle but important distinction. Um, for right now, I'm limiting my, my efforts to coming up with long descriptive prompts that try and accomplish it, but that's a more expensive solution in the long run. So eventually, you know, we'll have to approach the fine tuning model. So this is what one shot processing is. You, you don't worry about the fine tuning. You simply put in a, a giant example in your queries to get exactly what you want. And, and then hopefully it, it gives you what you want. And you, you, you iterate yourself over this until your prompt is giving you the kind of outputs that you want. Russ, when you're trying to introduce a new universe of data, say you've got a set of data about a person and you want to create a report using that specific data. You must put that data currently in the query. There's no. Correct. Um, there's How no else outside would it... way of feeding in new data. Yeah. In... Well, OK, we are the ones who are going to be doing that. We are going to use FileMaker in the middle to go out and get data create prompts with that data, then feed it to these engines to do the inference. So we could build interfaces where we say, hey, Google, do a search, then crawl the first few results, figure out what we want with those, get some text out of that somehow. Maybe we have to feed each piece individually. This is like a multi, step orchestrated integration solution. 
and that there should be some very powerful results that we're able to <laughs> do this. South Park, really? <laughs> Sorry, I'm seeing the chat. Um, uh, anyway, um, I don't know, does that make sense, Lynn? Yes, it does. Thank you. So when it comes time to doing the implementations, and now from a FileMaker point of view, uh, and really this, a lot of this applies to any environment, um, I think it's important to spend time to really understand exactly what you're trying to do. Um, it, it, the temptation is, hey, AI, figure out what needs to be done and do it. Okay, but it, it turns out it's not quite that simple. We have to teach the AI exactly what we want it to do. And in order to teach it what we want it to do, we have to know what we want to do. Uh, we have to. My clients, right? have, my clients have been asking for the telepathy plugin for like decades. Uh, well, that's a scary one. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, I have found that at least so far, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm what, two weeks ahead of the rest of you on this. So in my, in my vast additional experience, um, creating an exchange mechanism that takes your AA prompts and your data, um, you know, is really useful. So being able to say, Hey, I'm going to give you JSON that looks like this. And I want you to give me JSON back that looks like that. Here's an example of my input. And for that input, here's an example output that I want you to give. Here's another example of the input I'm going to give you. Here's another example of the output I want from you. Now here's my real input. And when you do prompts like that, it seems to work a lot better. Um, so you assemble. You have to uh, take a little bit of time to learn the the JSON structure for the for the prompt, and you you make a curl call, and you get a response object back. Within that response object, there's a bunch of metadata from OpenAI about your token counts and the state of the world, and then there's also uh, a, an element called content that's buried within choices, and you extract that. And if you specified structured content in your prompt, then your then the content that's returned will be structured. Okay, but then remember that even though you may ask for structured content, the hallucinating completion engine may still decide to decorate the response with commentary, punctuation, opinions, cautions, you know. So, um, so that's those are my high level perspectives on on that, and. Uh, and then open discussion, um, which I think was really why a lot of us were here is like, uh, so I just made a, a starting point of, of things we could talk about, you know, from use cases, business, you know, whatever you can read. So, uh, there seems to me to be a certain element uh, in some of these things of a middle schooler trying to write a five page essay with one page worth of uh, information. Yes, <laughs> very much so. and. And so the temptation is to have the large language model create the final output with minimal work and fully automate things. And the fact that it even comes close is like so amazing at first. That's why I showed the Dunning-Kruger graph at the very beginning. It's like, oh my God, this is amazing. And it really, it, it, let's be real, it is amazing that it's able to do it. But when you start digging a little deeper and you start looking at like, okay, Hmm. Almost every one of these responses starts with some sort of preamble bit and then maybe some specifics and some sort of generic closing thing. You, you kind of get the vibe of like, OK, I, I, this is probably being written by an AI. In fact, there are now tools out there that can detect whether text has been generated by one of these engines. And they're using it as part of the anti-plagiarism and anti, uh, you know, copying and originality stuff. So we have to be careful about relying entirely on um on the ai uh generating the content um ralph uh it's a great question ralph wants to know if you get a copy of my file i don't think this file is really ready for prime time uh yet um i would like to polish it up a bit and resolve some issues i have with it and i need to make it safe to deploy um by isolate i can't have any of my keys in it and stuff like that so it may take me a little bit of time but i would like to uh, package something up for the community so you guys can can learn off of what I've I've done. So eventually there there should be something. I don't know if I'll include all of it, um, but but some of this for sure. And for those of you who already know how to do JSON work and uh, 
API integration type stuff with JSON, um, the docs on the site are really pretty clear. So. Hey, okay. Russ, well, I have a quick oh. question. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. How, I'm sorry if you answered this, but how creative does it get in terms of its factual or non-factual response if you have put the constraints to a very low, you know, low level, like it's a high level of constraint? So the, the tightest test that I've done so far was that taxonomy example that I showed, the vendor classification example, where we have real world vendors with real world, you know, minimal data about them and a formal taxonomy that I created with my client. And we told the engine, you're limited to these choices given this input, go ahead and do that. And I set the threshold somewhat low on those queries so it didn't get too creative in that. And, and it so far has been pretty good. The client's been pretty happy with that sort of result. If I was to be much more free form and like, okay, I'll, I asked it to write a custom function to encapsulate the open AI API call, right? And it said, oh, this will be really easy. You use the loop command in your custom function. And it wrote this code that was a hodgepodge of Pythonic, PHP, JavaScripty lingo in the middle of the FileMaker uh, function call. Because it doesn't have a clear understanding that FileMaker is this and JavaScript is that and Python is this. It does know that it has, you know, whatever bazillion numbers of pages of examples of JavaScript that are out on the internet. So when you talk about JavaScript, it has lots of examples. When you ask it for Python, it has millions of pages of bad Python code out there that it can look at, and it will give you some <laughs> bad Python code back. Okay. We don't have nearly that amount of FileMaker code that's been out there that it can scavenge from. Now, for simple things, it'll be great because it will find it. It will find it in one of the forums. Okay. Which gets to one of the big questions. There are people who have built entire businesses out of structuring communities for us. Okay, and now these systems are just going to scrape that entire content and deliver it with a completely demonetized model for the people who created the content. Right, I mean, I mean, for as a user, it's kind of cool because I don't have to deal with advertising anymore directly. I, I'm paying a, a fraction of a penny a query. I'm paying for the use of the service. So I shouldn't be getting advertising for it. But then, of course, you know, there'll be guys that will come along that will offer free ones with advertising where the results that come back are gonna be skewed by the paid placement. So, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, if, if I wanted to write a version of uh, a, a trained version, you know, for FileMaker developers, I would wanna fine tune it with lots of examples from, you know, the people on this call that have written top level code, tested, reliable, lots of really quality examples. Um, and we'd want to give a lot of examples that are bad and we'd want to categorize them in the input to the model saying, this is a good example. This is a bad example. This is, and we don't need to tell it why it's bad. It will eventually figure out, oh, this is bad. Or, and it will determine the patterns of the badness. But that means that human beings have to, who know what they're doing, have to moderate that content. That's what's so kind of interesting about ChatGDT is that they put this whole human feedback loop into the training model to help teach it what conversational text chat is like. Because before that, the Text DaVinci 3 engine, which was, uh, which is kind of what's at, what's, uh, the model is what's based on, is, is more one shot. You say, give me a result and it would come back with, a, with what you asked for or not. We as content providers, as the developers have control over what we release into the wild for use as examples. We could even monetize that if that becomes a valid business model. What about all these people, the artists and stuff, the images that have been released previously before there was this awareness of what your content might be used for? Uh, are these people ever going to get any money? <laughs> you know, I, I don't think so. 
I mean, it's a tough. I mean, I mean, Getty Images is uh, you know one of the guy, one of the outfits I think that's filing suit to try and protect the rights of the of themselves as licensees for the, all these this, this this protected art. So unfortunately, it probably will boil down to which large corporations lawyers beat up which other large corporations lawyers. Um, the artists are and then the, the content creators themselves are not. Uh, I mean, we're just people. Right. I mean, how many of us can right. can can engage in that? I mean, that's just my personal opinion. Um, I think that um, we're we're into some interesting waters. I mean, we've seen what have we seen? OK, I, I wrote this article of a month or two ago comparing AI to the desktop publishing era where when desktop publishing first came out, you know, people were like, oh my God, I can create anything. And then, you know, we, we created a ton of crap, right? We didn't, we used the wrong fonts. We, we, we were really into like bad, bad design choices, but it was so different and so new, we got enamored by it. I think the same thing will apply. Uh, the same thing happened with the web. Uh, we built tons of horrible web pages for years before you know, we figured out how to write somewhat less bad websites. Um, uh, yeah, I and used then, to refer to that as the just because you can doesn't mean you should era. Well, and that's where we are with this AI stuff. We're we're gonna there's gonna be a metric ton of absolute noisy garbage that's gonna be AI generated that's going to cloud the search engine space unless Google and others can find ways to filter it out. And uh, and people are not going to vet the quality of the data that these machines are coming up with. So that you know, that's that's my personal take on it. So we're going to have to figure out how to con cope with that. Uh, uh, but there's massive opportunity, I think. I mean, this just, I mean, as as um, Nico was saying, the, the the you know, the cat's out of the bag. I mean, we're not going to be able to put this one back in. We're going to be living with this technology, and it's it'll be it'll be as disruptive. Uh, I mean, I was watching a, I think it was Frontline. Uh, was it last night or I watched it last? Night. I don't know when it came out recently about AI, and they were comparing it to, um, uh, you know, this the, the you know steam engines, like the impact of steam engines on agriculture or the impact of electricity on on society. It's kind of of that scale. And we don't have a clue, I think, what the implications of this are going to be long term. Um, and so it was actually out of the fear that that inspired to me that got me to try and grapple with this subject. That, that seems to be my, my habit historically. If I get scared of something, I want to try and master it to the extent I can to give myself the illusion that I have some degree of control over it. And that's basically where I'm at with AI. Anyone else using it or testing it? Well, I, I have a comment about content. Yeah, sorry. Because, oh. sorry. Well, I was going to say, I have uh, tested and I, for example, the other day I had a um, sort of a complex SQL qu uh, query that would take me a while to figure out. And I just typed in the question into a uh, chat. GPT, it came back with exactly the right query in two seconds. So that was very useful. Very cool. Yeah, I've played with it a bit too. I asked it to write some FileMaker code and it kept throwing in a script result when, you know, insert script result. And of course, it would, it, there wasn't any yet. So it didn't work too well, but it's been a lot of fun. But Lynn, coming to the content, so if all the news articles and posts and blogs are written by uh, AI, uh, is it worth reading? Do we want to read all the content created by AI? That's a very good question. It might be better than some of the content we get now. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> that's a sad that's, comment. <laughs> that, that, that's okay. My, my AI will read the stuff that your AI creates. 
<laughs> no, you know, it's, it's funny. I've got another example. So I'm writing a book. I've realized, you know, English is not my first language. So I write poorly. So my son installed Grammarly and I thought, oh, this is cool. So uh, it gives me really good suggestions. But I thought the new generations don't punctuate, you know, new generation of people don't punctuate what they write. So why are we writing correct grammar to a generation that doesn't understand or write properly? Does that make sense? At what point do we we transition to a group of of Gen Xs or whatever that don't capitalize words, do not punctuate? Do they want to I read? Think, I, I think the answer is as late as possible, <laughs> and we need to keep doing it at least to uh, inspire them. And keep a link to Shakespeare. Modeling. Yes. It, it's it's actually actually useful. I model. bet somebody who doesn't type it still benefit, realizes it helps them read it. Uh, yeah, a punctuation we've come to learn is really important. You know, the difference between eats, comma, shoots, and leaves, and eats, shoots, and leaves. I mean, it just... Uh, well, you you don't you didn't give point. us enough context for that, Lynn. But I appreciate what you <laughs> say. Yeah. Uh, well, that's the classic example a joke. of punctuation yeah. mattering. You know, um, between let's eat, comma, grandma, and let's eat grandma. You know. Yeah. There's uh, it contributes to clarity of thought and to getting your impressions over. Um, so Alan put a, a question in the chat, Russ, about um, moving a FileMaker script code to FileMaker. Can it convert to XML, I assume? Yeah, I'm having a conversation with uh, the engine right now to try and see what it does. So far, it told me to basically write the script myself in one copy of FileMaker and move it to another copy of FileMaker. And I, <laughs> uh, I don't know, is my screen still being shared, by the way? Yes, we can see okay. it. Okay. Okay. Um, so, okay. So, what if um, if you wrote the script? Okay. And I know, Alan, this isn't quite what you asked for, but I'm trying to approach it from the meta side as well. If you've already written, okay. Okay. Um, all right. Let's try it. Write a short script, Omicron um, script. Uh, what do we want to do? Um, uh, to um, take a address and form string and format it. multi-line label. This is pretty lame, but I'll see really this is a calc, but we'll see what it does. Let's see if it can even write the script. All right, set variable address to a value. All right, replace it with a suitable label, replacing it. So, all right. All right. So, okay. Can you render that script as, um, does Fam I forget right now, does Fimaker have a specific name for the XML grammar? Or is it just FileMaker XML? Does anyone know the technical? it does not have a specific name <clears throat> suitable for import into FileMaker? Okay, now this is the sort of thing I have a feeling we'd want to give it some examples to have it work right, where we could say, for example, here's a script and here's what the XML would look like. Here's another script and here's what the XML would look like. Now here's the 
the script I want you to convert. But let's Whoa. see. Whoa. Uh, I don't. It just did that, the that data. That doesn't look. That looks like a. It's a DDR this, import. That yeah, looks well, like no, the import thing. Yeah, this is XML uh, result. Okay, and this makes sense because it's got some DDRs out on the internet, maybe from Brushfire even. Um, that. Uh, ah. <laughs> well, that's actually the that's the FileMaker result format rather yeah. than the. the it's DDR. not the structure. Yeah. No. Um, it would need to be fed. Okay. So, so, thinking... so, so we'd have to train it on, on what right. that looks like. And uh, that might be a useful exercise to go through. But the risk of the thing hallucinating some different value in the middle of the string is pretty high and the odds of a human being catching that hallucination is pretty low. <laughs> but when you and, paste it, wouldn't you get, wouldn't you quickly, if you pasted this in, once they get the right uh, lingo, it would break probably if it was, if it had hallucinated at just the wrong spot. Otherwise you would catch the same kind of thing that you'd catch when it just gives you a bad function name or something. You would you would hope that the engineers have written the ability to trap for invalid XML produced by AI engines. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Let's see if it. Um, oops, I left off the word clipboard, which is the most important <laughs> word. Um, the XML tag is, is FML FMXML snippet. Okay. Good point, whoever said that. It's oh, also, well, it's got a four letter okay. code for scripts, X, M, okay. S, S, I think it is. So you see it got yes. creative here. <laughs> Cloak namespace. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're moving in the right kind of sort of direction. So this type of iteration that we're going through here is um, exactly what the prompt engineering kind of function is, right? You, you try things, you see what happens. Um, let me copy. Um, and there's some kind of, I, I do this with base elements and there's a, a format that you have to inject in the base elements for the snippet format. So this may get a little deep trying to get that into the clipboard. Yeah, well, so this is one of those things where the, the prompt might take up nearly all of your 4,000 characters in order to get, you know, 300 characters out. No. Okay, I'm gonna call okay. this end of the official meeting because I wanna thank everyone who has been here, but you don't have to leave. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and I'm going to Thank you. leave the meeting open for those who want to continue to discuss this. But I want to thank Nico and Russ and Dave and Chris and everyone who's attended today. Next month, it will be April 14th. And I think Bob Shockey will be the um, content organizer for that meeting if you need to get in touch with anyone. So uh, 